Okay, so that's the hour. So, uh, so let's get started. So uh, this is MSC 498, and so if you're not an MSC 498, uh, we do need all the computers, but kindly ask you to, uh, to vacate your computer to let the, the folks in the class use it. So appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so let me pass around the sign-up sheet. Um, so I don't think we really have any announcements today, just that, uh, to check on the syllabus, where we're at. Uh, so we're a little bit ahead of the game, so we're now October 7th. We're meant to be starting the LAMP walkthrough today. Uh, but as you remember last time, we actually started to dig into that, so, so we're probably, you know, 30% through that, so we might be able to finish that up today, so, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and so just to refresh your memory, we were doing our first not quite molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, we're trying to compute the cohesive energy of aluminum. Well, to remember, we're going to use lamps to basically do a potential energy minimization to find the relaxed crystal structure of aluminum. Uh, once we have that, we can use the force field. The, we're going to use uh, a particular Eden force field to evaluate the energy of our system and compare that to the energy if all the aluminum atoms were separated infinitely, which is going to be zero, and that's going to give us the cohesive energy of, of aluminum. And that's an important quantity you may want to know in sort of materials design, how tightly bound the atoms in a crystal are. Um, so we have some experimental values that eventually we're going to compare to. We have an experimental lattice constant, which is the, the same as, as what you were doing in your DFT calculations, which we're going to estimate. And so basically we're going to use lamps to try and do potential energy relaxation of the aluminum crystal cell and evaluate these two quantities. And so we said, Remember, we're not actually doing molecular dynamics yet. Hopefully, we'll do molecular dynamics a little later um, today. We're just doing a potential energy minimization. Why are we doing that? Because I want to have a slightly simpler input file to share with you the first time as we run through the input file. Um, and then there's going to be a couple of extra tweaks to actually convince the, the, the LAMP program to do integration of Newton's equations in motion. It's trivial um, to, to convince it to do that. But this input file is going to provide us all sort of the rudiments that we need. And so, uh, this is still recap. Last time I asked you to download this potential, and so you saw this very nice website which has potentials for almost all of the elements you, you'll typically work with as, as a material scientist, some binary systems, some ternary systems. You can just pull down the relevant potential. Um, and then you went to Compass, and you also downloaded the input file, which we started to work through. And we all changed our path last time to give us the access to the LAMPS executable that I installed for you on the EWS systems. And again, if you want to have a shot installing it on your personal machines, I provided those instructions, which are available on Compass. So have a go at that. If you're interested, ask me if you have any problems, and we can try and get you up and running on your personal system. Um, OK, then we began to discuss the, the input file, and we started talking about sort of the first two blocks. So initializing the simulation with some uh, units, some periodic boundary conditions, the, the atom style that LAMPS is going to expect. And then we actually built the, uh, the sort of unit cell. So, so the crystalline unit cell we're going to simulate. So we said that that's sort of the first ingredient in our molecular dynamic simulation. You need to tell the, the program exactly what atoms you're simulating, where they live in space. Um, you need to provide the force field, which is the second ingredient. And then you need to do integration of Newton's equations of motion, which we're not going to do here because we're going to do potential energy minimization. So we're just running through how you actually convince LAMPS to, to do those three things by writing stuff in an input file. Um, Okay, and so final piece of recap, we're going to do an SCC lattice with a guess initial lattice spacing of four. We remember the units of metal are angstroms. This is four angstroms. We know this isn't quite right, but it's kind of close. And so when we do our relaxation, hopefully we'll get a better estimate for that. We said we're going to build sort of just a simple box, so a block unit cell. Um, and then we're going to create that box. You can also create things like cylinders or spheres or a bunch of other geometries you may be interested in for a particular reason. Just go to the LAMPS manual, look up the region keyword, and you'll see all the magical um, shapes you can make. And then we said we're actually going to build our lattice now. So the lattice is going to be FCC4, which is the same as what we defined up here. And we're actually going to specify the orientations now. So, so the, the different crystal directions of our lattice, we could make these different if we wish to. And then we're actually going to create the atoms on the lattice. And then we have this funny last step, which we said, okay, we've created our fundamental simulation cell with a lattice at this point right here. And so we've populated it with atoms. Um, and then we said, if for some reason you're interested in a bigger unit cell, perhaps you think it's going to be, there's going to be important finite size effects and you haven't made your unit cell big enough, a quick way to do that is to use the replicate command. And so we were saying, this is our unit cell right now. 
It's got periodic boundaries in X, Y, and Z coming out the board. Actually, let's make it a little bit bigger. And so we're going to replicate it two by two by two. And so two in X, two in Y, two in Z, and that's going to be now our unit cell with periodic boundaries in X, Y, and Z. And so I just wanted to show you the functionality. You can make a little crystalline cell and then make it as big as you like using the replicate command. Okay, so that's where we left off last time. Are there any questions about anything so far? Okay, so I propose today we just keep plowing through this input file. So um, a lot of the things are going to be seem perhaps obscure to you the first time you see them. But really, once you understand this input file um, reasonably well, this will be the basic template of any LAMP input file you could ever care to write. And so it really is worth sort of understanding this a reasonable degree of detail. Um, okay, so we're just going to go through it slowly. Um, stick your hand up at any point if there's something you don't understand or you feel like I haven't explained something properly because I, I really do want you to understand what we're doing here. Unfortunately, this is basically the molecular dynamics. So running the code is very, very easy. You just type one line. This is where all the action happens. Um, so, so it's worth spending some time. Okay, so let's go on to the, the next section. So we've specified basically the initial coordinates of our system. Um, and now we want to specify the potential function, so how the atoms talk to one another. And so we're saying, okay, we're going to use pair style em slash alloy. So this says how the atoms are going to interact. It's going to be via an em potential, and that's a pairwise em potential. Slightly misnomer because we understand that the em does actually have multi-body effects. So the way that you embed things, you have to compute the electron cloud and the region of space they're living in. And so there are multi-body effects built into em, so this is slightly a misnomer. Uh, we're not going to worry about that. Um, and so now LAMPS is going to expect an in potential for an alloy. And we say, OK, LAMPS, here's where you're actually going to find all the parameters. Your pair coefficients, so the coefficients of the force field that are going to plug into this, this pair potential, are going to come from al99.em.alloy. And so that file clearly has to be present in the working directory of LAMPS, so it has to find it. Classic error, you run LAMPS, it freaks out, check, check your force field is actually in the working directory. Um, and then we tell them, okay, you're going to pick up the AL block. So actually, you can open this file. It's human readable, and you'll see there's a block with AL. So clearly, that contains the pair parameters for aluminum. And so we tell them, that's what I want you to read. And then we have this asterisk asterisk here. And so what does that mean? And so it's really telling LAMPS how atom type X interacts with atom type Y. And so because we only have one atom type here, we could have done one of two things. We could have said just 1-1, one, one, because atom type 1 is the only thing we have, and it's only going to interact with atom type 1, because everything's aluminum. Or we could provide this sort of wild card flag and say, does, we don't care what atom type you have, and uh, you're always going to interact with this potential. Okay, so if we had something a little more complicated, a binary or a ternary alloy, we'd actually need to worry about putting real numbers here. So atom type 1 interacts with atom type 2 in a particular way, so aluminum and silicon perhaps. Atom type 3 interacts with atom type 12 in some way. So this gets more and more complicated the more and more components that you have. But for our very simple system, we're just going to use wild cards because we only have one atom type. So is that reasonably clear? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So you just, you just repeat that line as many times as you need. Um, yeah, good question. And so the reason I know that we have atom type 1 is because when you create the atoms here, we've tagged them with type 1. And so you could create aluminum atoms here on a particular lattice. You could have another create line where you create silicon atoms in the interstices, for example, and tag them with atom type 2. And then when you come down here, you can tell LAMP how those two different atom types are going to interact. So a very extensible way of doing that. So you just add extra lines here. Okay, is that people okay with that? Okay, so then what, what's the next line? And so the next line specifies neighbors. And so we understand whenever you do a molecular simulation in periodic boundary conditions, formally we sort of trick the system into having an infinite sort of feeling to it because of these periodic boundaries. And so every atom in principle could interact with every other atom all the way out to infinity. So we don't want to compute that because it's computationally intractable. We believe that the potentials are going to die off within some sort of finite length. And so we don't need to worry about pairwise interactions beyond some cutoff. Okay, and so what we're saying here is that when we're doing our cutoff, 
And so the cutoff is actually built into the potential, so we don't need to worry about that. The in potential that we've loaded says, okay, if you tag atom I living right here, there's a particular cutoff radius beyond which we're going to compute neighbor interactions. And so atom I asks all its friends in the system, how far away are you from me? And if you're within the cutoff, I'm going to worry about computing my interaction with you. If you're outside the cutoff, I don't care. I'm going to say that the interaction is so close to zero that I'm not going to worry about it. Um, and so to be a little more efficient in computing these things, we define in LAMP a neighbor skin. And so the neighbor skin is basically a concentric circle, well, a concentric sphere in three dimensions, slightly larger than the cutoff. So the cutoff is, say, nine angstroms. Maybe we have a concentric sphere um, that goes out an extra two angstroms. Okay, and so why do we want to do that? So neighbor two bin, what is this saying? It's saying that there's a two angstrom skin thickness for the neighbor list. And so at every step of your algorithm, LAMPS worries about how far each particle has traveled. And if no particle has traveled further than two angstroms, you know it still lives within the neighbor list of your original tagged particle. Okay, so let's step back a second. Step zero of the simulation, we tag every atom, we compute its neighbors within this larger circle. So atom I knows its neighbors are atom 12, 15, 62, 101, and 13. Okay, we go to step one of the simulation. The atoms have moved a little bit. And so in principle, one would need to recompute all of the neighbors of all of the single atoms in our system. But if we know that no atom has moved more than two angstroms, we don't have to rebuild our neighbor list. And so we have this computational saving that prevents us from having to rebuild our neighbor, neighbor list every step. And so it saves us a bunch of time. And so there's some optimal value for this, which typically we don't know in advance, because obviously the bigger this is, the less often we have to rebuild it. But the bigger it is, it means the bigger our neighbor list is. And so the more sort of RAM that it causes us to have to carry around our simulation. So typically sort of two, four angstroms is a reasonable thing to take. It's just sort of a rule of thumb. Um, if you're doing really, really big simulations, you may want to optimize this, but for small things, typically two to four angstroms is going to be good enough. Yeah, question. Yeah, so the cutoff is actually built into the potential. And so when you tell LAMP, I want to use the al99.in.alloy, it's baked into this. Yeah. Um, you can look up the LAMP's manual, and I think there's a way to change it, but it's not advisable because it is sort of part of the potential. Yeah, good question. Yeah. So say that again. Exactly, that's right. So every atom attached to it, there is its own individual neighbor list. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so what's the next line? So the next line is very similar to this. It's related. It says, um, okay, build the neighbor list every 10 sets. Um, no matter what happens, but I want you to check every step whether we violate the skin thickness. Um, so maybe if you're not worried that the, uh, the, the you trust plants and the, 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 that you only want to rebuild every time some atom moves creating the skin thickness, you don't need this. Uh, people like to make sure the neighbor list is rebuilt periodically no matter what happens. So it's just, it's just standard practice. You rebuild it every 10 steps um, and you rebuild it more often if necessary. Okay. Okay, so then we are uh, defining some settings. And so all this is sort of setting up the system, uh, initializing the positions of the atoms, the way they talk to one another. Right here, we're doing some sort of user-defined things, basically adding some instrumentation to our code to return to us some parameters that we're interested in. Okay, and so LAMP has this thing called a compute. It's, it defines a sort of class of objects you can create in your input script. They're called computes. These are quantities that are recalculated at every time step. So you create a compute to calculate, say, the potential energy of your system, or say, the kinetic energy of a particular region of your system, if you're interested in that region for some reason. Um, later on, we're going, to compute, we're going to talk about something called variables, which are similar to compute, but they're basically formulas that are only evaluated on demand. And so if you want something to be computed every time step, use a compute. If you want something to be evaluated just on demand, say at the very end of your code, um, you use something called a variable. So we'll discuss those two things. Okay, so the way you define computes, and again, you can look this up in the LAMP manual, 
is you have compute, you have the name of your compute. So in this case, um, I'm defining a compute called ENG. What is ENG? You'll see there's a couple of arguments here. It refers to the, all the atoms in the entire system, and I want the potential energy per atom. So we're going to store the potential energy per atom averaged over all atoms in this variable called ENG. Um, okay, and so the way you then reference that later is you prefix it with C underscore. And so later in the code, we're actually going to try and you know, use this variable to do something. We're going to print it to the screen or put it into a calculation. And so the way you reference it is going to be C underscore ENG. It's just that's, that's how LAMP works. Um, okay, we have a second compute called eAtoms. And so this one is a little bit more complicated. So compute eAtoms. It's going to be over all atoms. It's going to be a reduce operation. It's going to be a sum. And that's going to act on the compute ENG. So what's happening here? Again, you can look up the LAMP literature to see what all these crazy arguments are. But basically, we're saying, I want you to store in this variable eAtoms something that summed over all the system, so all atoms, a reduce operation just means sort of aggregating everything together, and the reduce is going to be a sum, the CENG. So ENG is going to compute the potential energy for every single atom, then we're just going to aggregate all those potential energies into the energy of all the atoms. So C underscore ENG is potential energy per atom averaged over the system, C underscore E atoms is the total potential energy of the system. So two things you may be interested in from your simulation. And you can get crazy with these. You can make these as complicated as you like. And a lot of these are basically just cut and paste lines from the LAMP manual. So you just look at the LAMP manual and say, you know what, I'm interested in the pressure. Um, what do I have to write to get a compute that's going to return me the pressure? Um, OK, so questions on those? All right, let's keep going. OK, so then we have something called a dump. And so in LAMP, a dump is basically just what it sounds like. The code is running, and we want it to write some stuff to an output file. Um, so it specifies how to write output data. And so let's just look at the anatomy of a dump. Um, typically, you use only a couple of versions of these. Um, and so, so this, this is one sort of canonical example. So dump keyword, we're going to tag it with the number 1. And so in the same way as we tagged our atoms with, a key, with, a, with an identity 1, we can tag our dump with an identity of one, um, or, or whatever number you care, or actually a, a name if you prefer. But people tend to use letters, uh, tend to use numbers. And so we say we're going to dump, we're going to tag this dump with one. The dump is going to act on all atoms, okay, atom type one, and we're going to dump it to dump.relax. Um, okay, and so this is going to dump, excuse me, this is all atoms, this is the number of time steps, so I misspoke. So dump, we're going to tag it with the number one, at over all atoms, and it's going to dump every single time step to this file. So what's happening? And so we're telling LAMPS that we want to dump our output every single time step to this particular file. And by giving it this keyword, atom, LAMPS immediately knows what format to use. And so there are different formats you can pick. Again, look up the documentation. Atom is the one we use all the time. And it basically dumps it in this very nice format, which tells you the number of atoms, size of the box, and then the locations of all the atoms. And so it's a pre-formatted file that is very nice because it's immediately readable by Oviso. And so when we um, create this file at the end of our run, we can just drag and drop it into Oviso, and we can visualize our trajectory. Yes, question. Yes, it would. So then you would be tagging your dump with the, the index 2. And so it turns out you want to keep track of your dump. And so later on, you might want to undump your dump, which sort of closes out the file. Not great terminology, but that's how it works. Basically, this is opening a file. And then later on, you might want to close the file so you don't accidentally overwrite it. And so you just need to give it a tag. That's typically people give it numerical tags. We're saying it's going to operate on all atoms of the system. Sometimes you may only want to dump a part of your system. And so you may only be interested in, say, the active site of an enzyme or perhaps um, the crack tip in a particular simulation. Um, so you can choose which part of your system to dump. This is now the format. And so the format is going to be atom. And when we say atom, LAMP knows to dump it like this. The next number is the frequency. And so we want to dump it every single time step. If you're doing a really long simulation, you might not want to dump every time step because you're going to max out the memory on your computer and the thing's going to crash. And so you need to take care. You might do 10 or 100. It really depends how frequently you want to, you want to run. Exactly. 
So, yeah, so everything I'm presenting to you today is an example of using a parameter. And there are different ways to use parameters. And so um, just go to the LAMPS documentation, look up the keywords. The documentation is excellent, and you can see exactly what all these arguments are and how you can use them differently. Okay, so that's, uh, that's our writing. Okay, now we're actually going to get to the, 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 uh, the computation in the code. What, what are we actually going to compute? So we're going to reset our time step to zero. Um, so probably you don't actually need to do this, um, but if you're having sort of repeated runs, maybe, as you'll see later on, you do a minimization followed by an equilibration run, followed by a production run, and every time you want to zero your counter. So it's just good practice to zero your counter. So our time steps are going to be placed back to zero. Okay, and then we're going to define something called a fix. And so a fix is an operation applied at every time step. So let's run through the special categories of objects we have in LAMP so far. We have computes, which are things that are computed every time step. We have variables, which are basically user-defined formulas that you can evaluate on demand. We'll see one of them in a second. We have dumps, which is stuff that you can write to the, uh, the output files. And then we have fixies, which are operations that are bolted on to, um, to every time step. So typically, you will have an integration algorithm, although not here, uh, because we're just doing minimization. But typically, in an MD run, you will have the Verlet algorithm. And then on top of that, you define some fixies, which will specify like a barostat, a thermostat, or some particular constraints in your system. And so it's an operation that's applied to, to the system at every time step. So in this case, the fix we're going to apply is basically a relaxation fix. So you can look up the fix keyword in the LAMP documentation, see all the possible options. The one that we're looking at right now is going to be box slash relax. So fix, we're going to tag it with ID 1 because we're going to unfix it later. We're going to say it operates on all atoms in the system. Sometimes you may only want it to operate on a piece of your system. It's going to be box slash relax. So what the heck does that mean? It means it's going to isotropically relax the box. And so we're going to evaluate the pressure in the box. If the pressure is too high, we're going to make the box a little bit bigger. If the pressure is too low, we're going to make the box a little bit smaller to, to sort of equilibrate to our target pressure. And so it's going to be isotropic um, because we don't want to distinguish between x, y, z directions. Our target pressure is going to be zero bar, so basically zero net force, zero net pressure on the system. And then we're going to just specify this V max, which is a nice way of making sure you don't destabilize your simulation that we're saying the maximum volume change at any, any time step is going to be 0.1% of the box size. So you can imagine your simulation for some reason evolves a giant pressure and it really wants to relax very quickly. That could destabilize things and make your simulation go crazy. And so we just want to specify the sort of safeguard on it. So this is one example of a fix. If you look up the documentation, you'll see there are a bunch of other fixes. You can do innumerable things at every time step to simulate the particular system conditions you care about. Classic ones are thermostats and barostats. And when we do MD, we're going to see those. OK, so fixes are, are super important. OK. So what's the next block? So there's another keyword called thermo, which basically stands for thermodynamic information. And so when we call the thermo keyword, we tell LAMP, OK, I want you to compute all of these quantities at, a, at any particular time set. And I want you to start write it to the screen. And so it basically outputs thermodynamic information to the screen. If you want to output information to an output file, you'll need to use a dump command. So this is basically sort of on-the-fly runtime information. So you can watch your simulation run. It'll print it to the terminal. And you can see what the temperature, the pressure is. And if something starts to go wrong, maybe this instrumentation can help you figure out that there's a problem in your simulation before you go away for the evening and let it run all night in some terrible state. So it's basically user information. And so you can customize this, customize this infinitely, look up the thermal keyword, and you'll see all the stuff that you can write. And so basically what, what we are going to do is say, OK, thermal 10, meaning that we want to print it to the screen every 10 time steps. We don't care about every time step. We, we need it a little less frequently than that. Um, OK, so print to the screen every 10, 10 steps. And what style do I want? And so thermal style is going to be custom. So there are some built-in thermal styles, and you can look them up. It actually turns out that custom is the one that I find most useful because depending on the simulation I'm doing, I might want to be interested in different information. And so you can do thermal style, custom, and then it's just an argument list of stuff you want to print to the screen. And so if you look up thermal style or thermal in the LAMPS documentation, you will see all the different options that you can have LAMPS write to the screen. 
And so there are a bunch of built-in options that LAMP computes anyway as you're running through your simulation, and you can have it print them to the screen. So all the usual suspects you might expect, what step number you're at, the potential energy, the X, Y, and Z extent of your system, the pressure, the diagonal components of the pressure tensor, so the pressure in X, Y, and Z. And then you can also incorporate into this thermo any computes that you've defined previously. And so this is the E atoms compute, which is the, the energy of the system that we defined up here. And we prefix it with C underscore because we actually want the value of that compute. And so it's just sort of a, a case of having some experience as to what you think is going to be interesting to print to the screen. And then just looking at the list of possible options and writing down what, what you think is going to be useful. So in this case, because we're relaxing the system, I decided it's going to be interesting to look at the step number, the potential energy, the size of the system, and then the pressures in the system. Um, okay, so, so that was just my choice. You might pick something different. Okay, and so then we actually want to tell LAMPS, well, actually, what, what calculation are you going to do? I seem to have reset my time step. I'm telling you how to fix the uh, pressure at every time step, how you're going to print stuff to the screen. What are you actually going to do? We're going to do minimization. So here we're defining a minimization style, which is going to be conjugate gradient. Uh, we're doing potential energy minimization, which is why we're defining min style. If you were doing molecular dynamics, you would not define this. We would use something different, which we're going to see momentarily. And then we say, okay, now go and do the minimization. So this is actually the line where LAMP finally actually does something. It does the minimization using the conjugate gradient algorithm to try and minimize the potential energy of our system by relaxing the atom position. And so there's some parameters for a minimize. Again, I'm sorry to keep repeating this. Look up the documentation. You'll see the parameters. But basically, these guys are tolerances. And so we said, I want you to minimize to within a tolerance in the energy of 10 to the negative 25, to a tolerance of the force of a 10 to the negative 25, and a maximum of 5,000 iterations and 10,000 energy evaluations. So this specifies our tolerance. So how accurately do we want to compute um, the energy and the force? And this is just some safeguards. It stops our code running forever if it hits an error. And so we say, okay, if you've not converged by this time, probably something has gone wrong, and I want you to terminate rather than just run um, to infinity. Okay, so questions on that. Okay, so what should be, coming up, be becoming apparent is that the bulk of the input file is just setting stuff up, and then you actually do the run in one line. Okay, and so now we've done the run. And so what are we going to do now? So we're going to define some variables, which are formulas that we evaluate on demand, so distinct from computes, which are evaluated every time step. And we're going to use them to try and evaluate some things that our simulation is calculated for. So we've done the simulation, so how, how do we now get data out of it? So we've done something. We've minimized the potential energy of the system. Now let's interrogate the simulation and see what results we have. So back to the very first day when we said, um, molecular simulations or any sort of simulations can be thought of in vitro experiments. So we've done the experiment, now we're analyzing the data. Okay, so we're going to define some variables. So keyword variable, the variable name, and then what you actually want the variable to, to hold. And so we're defining a variable called n atoms, which is going to be equal to the number of atoms. And so look up the variable keyword, you can see all the things you can possibly assign. But basically we're just doing count all the atoms in the system. And so this, the anatomy of a variable line is keyword variable, the variable name usually equals, um, there are some other options, but you know, 99% of the time it's equal. And then you open quotes and close quotes and actually do some operations. And so just count all the atoms in the system is what the first one is saying. The second one is saying, I'm going to define something called TENG, which is a total potential energy. And so TENG is equal to the current value of my compute. And so compute C underscore E atoms is the potential energy in the system. The simulation is finished, and so now this is the final potential energy in the system. Okay, next one, variable A is equal to LX over 2. And so what does that mean? It's the lattice parameter. So remember, we did this thing way back up here where we replicated the box as 2 by 2 by 2. And so if we measure the extent of the box, which is L sub X, we want to divide that by 2, and that will give us the lattice parameter. And so that will give us the, the, the lattice spacing that we're interested in. Um, if we had replicate 1, 1, 1 down here, you would not want to divide by 2 because you, don't, you haven't replicated your system. 
Okay, and then the last one is the cohesive energy per atom. And so ECOH is equal to V underscore TENG. And so we define this thing TENG, and the way you dereference that, the way you access this value, is V underscore. So the way you access the value of a compute is C underscore. The way you access the value of a variable is V underscore. It's very simple. And then we're going to divide that by the number of atoms in the system. And so clearly the cohesive energy is going to be a function of our system size, and so we want to divide by the number of atoms in our system to get converged results. So variables. Um, any questions on those? The best way to play with variables is just to make some up, use them. Uh, LAMP tool can play, and you figure out where you went wrong, and, we, we, you, and you, can, you can learn that way. So learning by doing, which is sort of the, the entire point of this course. Okay, so we're, we're very close. We're almost there. We're actually going to do the run in a second, which is going to be incredibly painless. And so now we're just printing stuff to the screen. So keyword print. So you can make some nicely formatted print statements to the screen to actually spit out the, the final data you care about. And so print, open quote, total energy in electron volts. Why is it electron volts? If you go all the way back to the beginning, you'll see the unit, uh, the metal unit system measures energy in electron volts. So it's always good practice at the very end to remind yourself what, what the units are. Um, so that when your friend runs the code, they can see, okay, it's actually electron volts. They don't have to know anything about the unit system that you decided to use in your simulation. Okay, so total energy in electron volts is going to be this weird statement, dollar, open curly bracket, T-E-N-G, close curly bracket. And so what's happening there? We're taking this variable total energy and we're pulling the value out of it. And so there are some subtleties between when do you use V underscore T-E-N-G and when do you use dollar open curly bracket TENG? And so you can look up the documentation for, for when you use one, when you use the other. Sometimes they're both applicable. Um, it turns out when you're using print statements, the dollar open close curly brackets is the right one to use. It, it just dereferences the value of TNG and prints it to the screen. Um, similarly, you can print the number of atoms, you can print the lattice constant, and you can print the cohesive energy. And so that's giving us our final results from our simulation. And then you print the nice line at the end, all done, which tells you that you completed everything without any apparent errors. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. And so really just thinking again of this as sort of a reference slide. And so I'm trying to explain to you the anatomy of the script. The way you're really going to understand and learn this is by manipulating it yourself, seeing what happens to your simulation when you change these things, when you add extra lines, when you remove lines. But think of this as sort of a baseline template. Okay, so let's actually run it. And so... Um, the run line is super simple, and so it's just like Quantum Espresso, we call the executable, we feed it our input file, and actually we don't have any output file, which means we're just going to let it spit stuff to the screen, because LAMP also produces an output file at the same time, called a log file. And so we see all the thermal data to the screen, this is all reproduced in a log file, and we're also producing any of the output dumps that we requested from LAMP. Um, so let's go ahead and, and run that. Okay, she wants to be in the right directory, yeah. Great, okay, so we're... Was anyone having trouble getting that to go? Okay, terrific. And so we uh, we all managed to run our run our first molecular dynamic simulation using using labs. Um, okay, so let's just pick apart the output a little bit so we understand what happened. And so first of all, this should have run very very quickly. Um, so this is not characteristic molecular simulations. Typically, these take sort of minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, depending on how long you want to simulate for. We're just doing a very simple energy minimization, so it ran in just a few seconds. Um, okay, so we can read through the, the output that LAMP spat out. And so up here you can see um, how it specified the lattice spacing. And so we got the uh, building the system with lattice spacing that we specified, which was four angstroms. 
Um, it tells us it's going to be a serial run. If you have a parallel version of LAMPS, it will actually give you some information about how many cores it's running on um, and, and sort of how it's decomposing itself among those cores. You should then see the custom thermal information that we, that we requested. And so you can see that what we're printing here is exactly what we asked for, which was the set number. So we're printing every 10 sets. We actually terminate, in this case, on set 14, so it prints the last one. Um, so 0, 10, 14 are the, the uh, sets that we print for. Central energy, extent of the system in X, Y, and Z, and then all the pressure information. Um, okay, it then tells you how long it took. It tells you some information about the minimization, whether it converged or not. And so you, sh you should always look at your output and see whether it's spat out any errors. Um, in this case, everything seems to be fine. And then pr print some information about how fast it was, so how much time was spent in each of these elements, so how much time was spent in enumerating pair interactions, computing neighbor lists, um, doing communication between processors, etc. cetera. Uh, it does some then accounting of the atoms at the very end, so just some generic um, information about how many atoms were in your system, et cetera, et cetera. And then the interesting part is sort of right at the bottom usually. And so first of all, you want to look at neighbor counting. And so it turns out the number of neighbor uh, rebuilds is written here, and the number of dangerous builds should also be printed here. And so what's a dangerous build? A dangerous build means that lamps figured out that actually some of the particles moved larger than the skin thickness uh, before it had a chance to rebuild the list. And so that can happen if you don't properly specify this command right here. And so that's why you want check yes here. And so if you have check yes, this says, okay, remember, I want your neighbor list to be rebuilt every 10 steps, but you should also rebuild it on demand if atoms move longer than the, the neighbor thickness. So if you have check no here, you may sometimes get dangerous builds. And so you should be a little bit worried if you get dangerous builds because the system um, is not being, the energy of the system is not being properly accounted for. Um, so people have different opinions on this. Some people think dangerous builds don't really matter. Um, sometimes you have to tolerate dangerous builds if it's just too expensive to recompute your neighbor list because your system is so big. Um, if you can avoid it, it's good not to have any. Okay, and then at the very bottom, we have our terminal print statements, and so spitting out the stuff that we're interested in. So there's terminal print at the very bottom of our input file. The two we really care about, I've highlighted here, which are the lattice constant in angstroms and the cohesive energy in electron volts per atom. And so does everybody have values for these that look somewhat similar to sort of 4.05 and negative 3.36? Anyone have any crazily different answers? Okay, great. So you, you've made your first prediction using classical um, electrodynamic dynamic simulation for uh, the lattice constant and the cohesive energy of aluminum. Um, okay, so how well did we do? And so the lattice constant and the cohesive energy that came out of LAMPS were 4.05 and negative 3.36 in angstroms and electron volts per atom respectively. And then on one of the first slides I uh, pushed up today, you'll see I uh, showed you the experimental values for the same. Um, and so we did pretty well. We're, we're in sort of, um, you know, 1% or so of, uh, of the experimental value. And so this seems really great. So we should perhaps temper our excitement compared to quantum espresso, because quantum espresso was a DFT calculation which formerly had no adjustable parameters. Basically, we were using the laws of quantum mechanics to make an ab initio prediction for something. Um, in that case, the, the separation between the two protons and hydrogen, or in your project, lattice constant of aluminum. Of course, we understand we do have to have exchange correlation functionals, all that stuff, so there are approximations. But formally, it's an ab initio technique. Um, can anyone suggest why we might be less excited by the really good agreement for classical molecular dynamics? So probably the information is, is right here that you need. <laughs> okay, and so, the force field that we use is clearly going to be parameterized to experimental data. And so the al99.eam.alloy potential, the reason it's up on the NIST webpage is because it does a good job of reproducing experiments. So if it did not do a good job of reproducing experimental data, it wouldn't even exist. Um, okay, and so we should expect these things to agree pretty well. So, so, so that, that's, that's, that's one thing. Um, so how about if we were studying a brand new material that we did not know the cohesive energy and the lattice constant from experiment? Could we possibly use molecular dynamics in some way um, to sort of run simulations of this material? Um, 
Okay, so, so maybe if these are the things we're interested in, we would say, well, first of all, we should probably do a first principles calculation because no force field exists that I can possibly use to do molecular dynamics. But then what if we were interested in longer time length scales that you could not do using ab initio methods, that you had to use molecular dynamics? So the answer is ICME, so Integrated Computational Materials Engineering. Perhaps we can use some very high level theory, so DFT, quantum special calculations, to get the cohesive um, energy, the lattice spacing, perhaps some other elementary properties of the material. And then perhaps we could use these to build our own force fields to put into molecular dynamics. So that's not a mean task. It's, it's sort of a very complicated thing to do. But in principle, it could be done. And so materials are brand new. There's no experimental data for Materials are really hard to analyze experimentally. So um, materials that may exist in sort of the vacuum of space that you can't readily study in the lab are materials that are highly radioactive. Perhaps you can do DFT calculations to build yourself a nice molecular dynamics classical force field and then run that force field to make predictions at length and time scales that are simply inaccessible to DFT. So how might that work in principle? So if we go back to our quantum espresso module, the lattice constant we computed from quantum espresso was sort of 4.007. Yours might be a little bit different uh, depending on your, the results of your homework. The one we got from LAMPS is pretty close, 4.05, experiment 4.04. .04. If we were to build a force field based on this lattice constant, maybe we could run it in LAMPS and make some molecular dynamics predictions. And so the whole idea is that the lower level of theory sort of has this, if you go back to that nice slide, there's this sort of hierarchy of interactions. And so there's feed forward between low levels of theory to higher levels of theory. And so we're moving up in length and time scales. And that's the entire basis of ICME. Um, and so really this is the fundamental spirit of integrated computational materials engineering, using low-level theory to parameterize higher-level theory. And as we see when we go on to the finite element module, um, this can go all the way up. And so basically you could use molecular dynamic simulations to predict things perhaps like Young's modulus, um, conductivity of a material, and use that to parameterize some, um, some elements of your finite element simulation, which can go to even longer lengths and time scales. So the whole idea is that we know we can't use every level of theory at every level of length and time scales. So how do we systematically and smartly build up this hierarchy? Okay, so that's the results of our predictions. Uh, it's our comparison to experiment, and it's the idea of ICME. Yeah, question. I have a question about the first bridge of the and the quantum dynamics. So what is the difference between quantum dynamics and the quantum Um, so it really, it's very um, context dependent. So it depends on what you care about. So in the classic example, you need to build a force field for molecular dynamics. And so you need to know sort of equilibrated information about the crystal structure and the energy of the system. And so you would take those things that you compute from your DFT simulation. If you um, wanted to do something fancier, maybe you were building a reactive force field, Perhaps you could use energy on bond breaking and making from DFT and use that to build your molecular dynamics force field that actually incorporates those energies. And so it really depends what you care about, what do you need. Um, so the question you have to ask yourself is, number one, what's the question I'm interested in? Number two, how am I going to answer that question? And then number three, if my current level of theory I need to answer that question doesn't have the information I need, can I get that from a different level of theory? So imagine ultimately the thing you're interested in in this example, which I, I didn't want to start digging too much, it's basically looking at reinforced titanium armor. So maybe it's, you know, how thick does my armor need to be to repel a particular projectile? Um, so if you don't have continuum models or finite element models that are adequate for this brand new material you're designing, you say, okay, well, maybe I can delve down to molecular dynamics in order to get these parameters. So for the uh, bending modulus of the material, then you find out you don't have the information you need to do the molecular dynamics simulations. So you have to delve down to DFT to get those, those information. Um, so it really depends on what you need, how are you going to get it. So it's, it's just a, it's a question of sort of experience and what this course is trying to give you is an understanding of what each level of theory can furnish. Yeah, great question. Um, okay, so those were the results. And then because we're doing simulations, we always have to make movies and pictures. Um, and so let me show you this short video, which is basically how you visualize in Ovito. Um, okay, so this is my desktop 
This is the results of my simulation. So you can see my Eamforce field, my input file, uh, my executable. And then these are the two outputs. So you can look in log.lance, which is basically just a log of what was printed to your terminal. So it's been dumped to the terminal for you to see what's happening on the fly. It's also been dumped to this log file um, for, you, for posterity. And so you can go back and look at this and see what actually happened. And then we asked Lance, you'll remember, to make this dump.relax, which was dumping the atom coordinates at every step of our minimization. And so it's dump.relax that you can visualize in Ovito. And so if you type into your terminal Ovito, O-V-I-T-O, -O, you should get um, a nice Ovito GUI is going to pop up. This was done on my laptop, and so you're going to see that I'm actually going to um, just click at the bottom and pull up Ovito as an application. Okay, so Ubito came up. Oops. Trying to get this bar to go away at the bottom. Okay, good. All right, so I'm just activating Ovito. You will type Ovito into your terminal. Okay, the Ovito GUI comes up. You go up to File, Open Local File, and you just navigate to dump.relax. Open that up, and all the information will come here. You go down here and say file contains multiple time steps, and hit play. That's all, that's all there is to it. So I'll play this video again in a second. Okay, so let's see that again. Launch Ovito. File open. Navigate to your dump.relax, which is in this nice format that Ovito immediately recognizes. You have to tell Ovito there's more than one time step in the file, and then you can hit play and watch the system relax. And so the potential energy is being relaxed by conjugate gradient. And so you can see the, the um, atom spacing is moving around. We're changing the lattice constant. And you can see the size of the box is also moving a little bit. And so you can also see um, the size of the, the system. And so this was our initial unit cell. And then we replicated it two by two by two. And so you can see that when you measure the extent of your system in x and divide it by two, that gives you the lattice spacing, which was what we told LAMPS to furnish us at the very end of the simulation. And so visualization is really invaluable in molecular dynamics, um, perhaps even more so than in quantum espresso uh, doing DFT. So, so it really gives you an idea, have I set up the system in the way that I think? Is it sort of moving reasonably? Um, reasonably meaning the atoms aren't going completely crazy, the box isn't exploding. Um, so you can have trust, a sort of a sanity check, first level of check that so your system is doing something reasonable. And then maybe you can, you can interrogate the results more quantitatively. So it's the first level of error checking, basically, is the way that I think about it. And then it's also a nice way to sort of present your images and your results. Okay, so that was um, your first simulation, which was relaxing aluminum. So was everybody able to run the simulation and visualize? Does anyone have any trouble with Ovito? Okay, terrific. And so Ovito has a whole bunch of other functionality, which we will discuss um, in the context of actually running a molecular dynamic simulation. But well, that's just sort of elementary use of Ovito. Um, okay, so let's take a few minutes. Um, so we'll come back in sort of two or three minutes, and we'll start up the, the second part, which is actually running a molecular dynamics simulation. All right. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about running our first real MD simulation. So not doing potential energy minimization, actually using the Verlet algorithm to integrate Newton's equations of motion and do a molecular dynamic simulation. Okay, so, so the, uh, the example I'm going to show you here is sort of motivated by material failure by propagation of exterior cracks. And so if you have a material, it's fatigued, it develops some cracks in the outside, and then you place the material under tension, those cracks can propagate into the, into the interior and cause sort of catastrophic failure of your, of your material or your system. Um, so if we were worried about amorphous materials, so systems that we were going to treat just as a continuum, perhaps we would use our finite element models or actually even just continuum models in order to simulate how, how cracks might propagate. 
And so this is an example of just solving some PDEs, uh, partial differential equations, to predict the stress field around a, around a crack tip. Um, if you think the atomistic details are important, which frequently they are, uh, because cracks will propagate differently in different crystal phases, um, it's actually the separation of the atoms and the material that are causing the crack to move, um, typically continuum models were, will not give you that level of resolution. And so because the atoms are simply not present in these models, um, you need to resort to a different level of theory, and that level of theory is typically molecular dynamics. Um, so what can we do? So using molecular dynamic simulation, we can visualize the stress field around the crack tip with atomistic resolution. And so, so this is pretty cool. So in this example, what I'm showing you here is we've built a crystal system. We've sort of excavated a crack in the system, and we've placed it under tension. And this is exactly the simulation we're about to do in about, in about 10 minutes. Um, then what you can do is you can ask your molecular dynamic program to go in and tell you what is the local um, force or local pressure or local tension, whatever one of these you, you care about, they're all sort of quite ill-defined on the atomistic level. So basically, what sort of force is felt by each atom? And so in this case, what we're visualizing is the X, uh, sorry, excuse me, the Z force felt by each atom. And so you can see around here, there's large gradients in the color. And so these, these atoms are feeling a large Z force, which is sort of pulling them apart. And so this provides you sort of crazy level of detail into, into how this crack tip is going to propagate. You can predict the stress field, you can predict which atoms are going to move next, and see actually how the crack moves through the interior of the material. Um, okay, and so this is the, the simulation we're going to set up. We're going to construct an exterior crack in a semi-periodic FCC aluminum crystal, and we'll see why it's semi-periodic in a second. And then we're going to measure the atomistic stress upon deformation, basically just by putting it under tension, seeing what happens. So the movies we generate at the end of this is actually, are actually going to be very cool. You're going to see this crack propagate through your material. Okay. So let's download an E potential. You have this potential because you pulled it down for the last piece of, uh, piece of work. If you're feeling fancy, you could download a different potential. I think there's an AL like 2000 EM alloy. Um, so if you think the potential that was developed in the year 2000 is better than the one developed in 1999, you could try that one um, or, or whatever one you care to do. And so, Grab a potential for aluminum. Okay, then go to Compass and grab the following files, al underscore crack.in, al underscore eq.m, and al underscore crack.m. So what are these? Clearly, this guy is our input file. Uh, we're going to take a look at that in a second and see how we're going to set up our system and run our MD simulation. These two are MATLAB codes for doing the post-mortem analysis. And so we're going to generate some dump files from our input file when we run LAMPS. Um, and I've just written up two MATLAB scripts that are going to analyze those files and make some nice plots for you. Um, so this will also be helpful for your project. You can use these scripts to sort of um, change them around a little bit and use them to, to visualize your, your, your data. Um, okay, our in potential and our executable. So does everybody have all of these? Is anyone still downloading from Compass? Okay, so let's, uh, let's keep going. So we're going to run through this input file. You're going to see that it's actually very similar to the previous input file. Um, it's just going to be a little more complicated in some places because we're making a little more complicated of a system. Um, instead of having a sort of just periodic infinite aluminum crystal, we're actually going to have to define a semi-periodic system, and we're going to have to yank on the walls to apply some tension. And so let me jump forward a couple of slides just to show you a visualization of the system because I think that will help sort of clarify a lot of the, the lines in the input file. This is slide 32. So basically, we're going to make a system that looks like this. So it's just a giant chunk of aluminum atoms. If you look at sort of the perspective view, you can see the x, y, and z directions. And so it's actually going to be finite in x. And so it's finite in x. The crack is going to propagate through here. So there's no periodicity in this direction. Once the crack actually propagates through here, we'll have two separate chunks of aluminum that we could pull apart forever. Um, it's not periodic in Z, because we're actually going to grab the top and the bottom wall, and we're going to pull on them. It is periodic in Y, because we want to simulate sort of a notch in an infinite material. And so this is like we had a um, large chunk of material that's infinite in this direction, and we're carving out a notch in that material. So are people OK with the geometry of the system? And so typically what one wants to do is make sure that your Z and your X dimensions are just big enough 
such that the, the, the crack propagation, at least in the early stages of the propagation, is not influenced by the system size. Another way of thinking about this is why can we not have periodicity? If we did have, peri have periodicity in Z, we would sort of be pulling the top wall directly into the bottom wall. So this guy would fall out the top of the box and come back here, and nothing would happen. We're sort of pulling the walls into one another. So we can't do that. Um, and why can't we be periodic in X? Because then we have an interior crack. Because as we walk out this wall, we see a crystalline material. So that's a different simulation entirely. That's an interior crack, and that's not what we're interested in right now. And so this requires just a little bit more thought about setting up the system. So just remember in your head, periodic in Y, it's not periodic in X or Z. So let's see how we actualize the system in the input file. So going back to slide uh, 30. Okay, so let's open the input file in your favorite text editor or in your terminal using last, head, or cat, or whatever you care um, to use. And initialization block. So we're going to go through this a little bit quicker because we've seen a lot of this before. Um, so if you feel like you, you want to stop and dig into something a little more detail, just, just stick your hand up. Okay, so initialization, units are going to be metal. We're going to be three dimensions. Boundary is the first place where we have a difference. And so we're going to be SPS. So what does this stand for? Um, this actually stands for shrink wrap. And so shrink wrap meaning that the boundary is just big enough to incorporate all the atoms in your system. And so it's almost like you're, you're shrink wrapping your system. So let's go forward to the visualization. And so you're shrink wrapped in X, meaning that the boundary of your box is just big enough such that all of the atoms are contained within your box. So that's why it's called shrink wrapping. We are periodic in Y, and again, we're shrink wrapped in Z. So we're setting up the proper periodic boundary condition. Atom style atomic, um, as always, because the in potential is expected, um, is written in sort of atomic style, so we need, to, we need to clarify that for lamps up here. And then we're defining our first variable. And so the keyword, variable, the name of the variable, lat param, equal to 4.05. So why are we doing this? Because now when we actually use lat param later in our input script, it's equal to 4.05, and we can change this very easily at will. And so imagine you were interested not in aluminum, but silicon, which has perhaps a different lattice parameter. You'd only have to change that in one place in your input script. You wouldn't have to go all the way through and change 4.05 to whatever it is for silicon. So just saving ourselves some work by defining a variable. And so every time we call V underscore lat param, we're interpreting, uh, Lance is interpreting that as 4.05 um, angstrom. Okay, atom definitions. We're setting up an SEC lattice with this value of the lat param. Um, so we're using actually in this case the dollar open and close the curly brackets to dereference the value of lat param. Um, then we're saying region, the whole region is going to be a block and the block is going to be of this size. So 040, 04, 040. So 040 angstroms in X, 0 to 4 angstroms in Y, 0 to 40 angstroms in, in Z. So you'll see later in the um, in these slides, if this system is so big that it's taking forever to run on your workstations, you can cut it in half. So you can make it 0 020, 0 02, 0 020. You'll just make your simulation go quicker because there are less atoms. Um, we create the box. So we've seen that before. We create the lattice and populate it with the atoms. And this time we're doing replicate 111. So we're actually not doing any replication in this case. So you could omit that line if, if you wish. Um, first field, this is the same as before, I think. Um, everything's the same, perhaps, except here, where we're saying I actually want you to um, compute the, the neighbor every one step. Um, it's just your choice. Okay, so we've seen all this stuff before. Are there any questions on any of the setup here? Okay, so the new stuff, which looks a little complicated, but it's really just doing geometry, is here. So if I skip forward again to one slide, what we said is we're going to define a block of atoms as the top wall and the bottom wall, and we're going to yank on them to apply our attention. So we need to define these groups. We need to tell lamps, okay, hey, lamps, there's a group of atoms up here called the top wall, and there's a group of atoms down here called the bottom wall, and I'm going to be pulling on them. And so we need to put those atoms in those groups. So we've defined our system, um, and basically all of this block is just basically defining those groups. And so I define these variables, dx, dy, dz, which are equal to sort of the lattice parameter plus a little bit. And so when I increment by dx, I make sure I catch the whole atom that's, in, that's uh, sort of dx up. If it was equal to exactly the lattice parameter, that would be no good because it would land on the atom, and then it's ambiguous whether you capture the atom or not. Um, Okay, and then I'm just saying, well, what is the 
value of the lowest x dimension, the highest x dimension, lowest y, highest y, lowest z, highest z. And so that's telling me sort of the extent of my system in all directions. And then basically I'm just saying um, how far down and how far up do I want to come to capture these atoms in the top and the bottom world. And so basically I'm just saying I want to compute the maximum value of z, and I want to come down by dz and capture all of these atoms. I want to define the minimum value of z, come up by dz, and capture all of these atoms and define a group. And so that's exactly what's happening here. I'm saying I'm going to define a region, the top wall. It's going to be a block. It's going to be infinite in x, infinite in y, but it's going to start at min z and go up to infinity. And defining the bottom wall is everywhere in x, everywhere in y. It's going to go start from infinitely, z, uh, infinitely negative in z and come up to max z, and that's going to capture the bottom wall. So top wall starts at min z, goes to infinity. Bottom wall starts at negative infinite z and comes up to max z, and that's just going to capture these atoms. So if you're interested, I can, I can pick apart this uh, a little more with you, but basically it's just a standard way of grabbing atoms into groups. Okay, and then we're defining these groups, so we have a top wall and a bottom wall, and then actually we're lumping the top wall and the bottom wall into something called boundary, and then we're defining everything else in the system as mobile. And so it's just using some tricks to define our groups. So now at the end of the day, we have what we want. We have the top wall, we have the bottom wall, everything that's not in either of those is called mobile. And so why is that important? Well, we're going to yank on the top wall and the bottom wall, and we're just going to allow the mobile atoms to do what they will under Newton's equations of motion. Okay, so any questions on this? As long as you get the idea of what's happening here, that's all I want to convey. Um, you can take a look at all the syntax later, and if you're interested, I, I, can, I can help you understand it a little more. Okay, so we've defined our groups. Now we need to build a crack. And so it's very similar to this. Basically, I'm just using the geometry of the system to define this region of space and remove all the atoms from that region of space. So how do we do that? I'm defining the extents of the crack, as z high underscore crack, z low underscore crack, x high underscore crack. Um, and then we're saying, let's define this region as a void. And so we're calling it void. So that's our tag. Instead of using a number one, we're actually using a, 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 a sort of word tag, which is void. We define the, the region, and then we go in and we say delete atoms within the region void. So again, if you just appreciate sort of what's happening there, um, if you'd like to dig into the syntax more, I, I, I can help you, help you understand that. But we're going into our system, we're removing atoms. That's all we're doing. Okay, then some settings. And so we're interested in a few things, and so we're making some user-defined parameters. So what we're interested in, first of all, keyword computes, we're calling it csim. It's gonna act over all atoms. And it's going to compute central slash atom FCC. So what the heck is this? This is the central symmetry parameter for each atom in an FCC lattice. So basically, it takes the idealized FCC lattice, and it asks each atom in your system, how similar are you to the idealized lattice? And so if you have a central symmetry, uh, which is basically how close your neighbors are in all directions, that looks very like an FCC lattice, you get a particular low value central symmetry parameter. Um, and if you deviate massively from the FCC idealized lattice, you'll, you'll get a very different value for your central symmetry parameter. So it provides sort of a local measure of how much each atom is close to its perfect crystalline configuration. And so, so it's just a standard measure in um, electro simulation in order to tell you how badly you're deforming from your crystal. And so that's going to happen clearly when you yank your crack and the crack propagates. Um, we're also defining the energy, which we defined before, and also the atom stress. And so you can look up these keywords, and so atom stress is going to act over all atoms, and it's going to be a stress per atom, and then there's this special extra keyword, which is Vario, which tells LAMP how you want it to compute the stress. Um, so you can, you can look up this in the documentation, but this is pretty standard. Okay, so any questions about the system setup? Yeah. Um, so there's space where, sorry? Oh, so, um, so LAMP doesn't care about space. And so it's just, it's just purely for formatting. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I should have mentioned that. That's right. So it's just to make it easier for me to see, okay, this is the keyword command, and then this is, these are the arguments. 
Okay, so we set up our system. We believe it looks like this, and so we should double check this. Clearly, I've viewed this in a veto after the fact, and it conformed to, uh, to what I expected. If your system looks really weird, then clearly you have a problem, and you can't believe the results of your, of your simulation. Okay, so then how do we actually simulate? So we have this block called equilibration. So first of all, we set up our system, and then we have to equilibrate the system. And so the atoms we've placed down on a perfect lattice at sort of zero temperature, and so we need to equilibrate the system to the conditions that we care about, which are typically standard temperature and pressure, 298K1 atmosphere, until the system is equilibrated and happy. Only at that point can we start to pull on the system and believe the results of our simulation. So we're going to reset our time step counter, and we're going to specify our time step to be 0.002. And so it turns out that if you go back and look in the units of metal, they're in picoseconds, and this is going to be two femtoseconds. And so like I said, if you're running a molecular dynamic simulation, typically your time step has got to be one, two, maybe four femtoseconds. Beyond that, you're going to get instability, and uh, your numerical integration algorithm is going to cause your system to explode. And so standard choice is two femtoseconds. Okay, now we're doing molecular dynamics. And so we said in some of the, uh, the theory lectures, trying to provide you the fundamentals, that it's always a good idea to initialize your atoms with some velocities so they don't experience heat shock as soon as you start your simulation. And so LAMPS provides a very clean way to do this using the velocity keyword. So velocity keyword, we're gonna apply it to mobile. So that's all the mobile atoms. So the atoms that are not part of the top wall or the bottom wall. We're gonna create velocities at 300 Kelvin using this random seed. We want to create their linear momentums that don't worry about creating any, and also create their rotational momentum. So you can look up this, but basically this is a standard way of creating your um, atoms to have random velocities drawn from a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution at 300 Kelvin. So just like what we said in the, in the theory lectures. This means that all the atoms are already, already have some velocity when you start your simulation, and they're not going to experience some crazy heat shock once you start running. Um, conversely, on the boundary atoms, so the guys in the top wall and the bottom wall, we're going to set their velocities to zero. And so because we're going to end up pulling on those, we don't actually want them to jiggle around. They're just going to provide sort of static anchor points that we're going to apply tension to. Okay, now we need to define a fix. And so in this case, the fix we're going to apply is a thermostat and barostat. And so our fix, we're going to tag it with, uh, with number one. It's going to apply only to the mobile atoms, and we're going to apply an NPT thermostat and combined thermostat and barostat. And so it's going to be the NPT ensemble, so we're fixed the number of atoms N, we're fixing the pressure P, and we're fixing the temperature T. And so the temperature is going to be 300, 301. So what does that mean? It means that we start at 300 Kelvin, um, and so we, we finish at 300 Kelvin, and then we start the, um, and so we're not actually going to do any ramping. And so you could actually apply a ramp to your temperature if you wanted to progressively heat or cool your system. In this case, and you can look up the argument list and fix, it basically just says, I just want to keep, keep constant temperature at 300. Um, then we're applying a barostat, but only in Y. And so the barostat in Y is going to be start at zero and finish at zero. And so why are we not applying one in X and Z? Well, because we don't need to because we're finite in those dimensions. So we have shrink wrap boundaries in X and Z. So we only need to equilibrate our pressure in our periodic dimension, which is in Y. Um, it probably wouldn't hurt if you wanted to do isotropic, but the problem is that you could cause your atoms to sort of blow off into space. Um, because you're finite in X and Z, and so the atoms are not being held by an exterior wall, and so they could just fall out into space, which is why we don't really want to do that. Um, okay, and so that's the fix that we're going to apply every time step to maintain our temperature and our pressure at the conditions of interest. Okay, next block, instrumentation. And so this is the, uh, the block that we're going to start print to the screen. And so in this case, we've actually chosen to use a fix to print to the screen. Uh, excuse me, to print to an output file. And so I didn't tell you this before, but you can dump to an output file, and you can also fix to an output file. And so the fix we're going to use, uh, we're going to tag it, we're going to call it writer. It's going to apply to all atoms in the system, and it's going to print every 250 time steps the following information. So we're actually going to store the information in variables just for ease of, uh, ease of programming. And so variable S1 is going to be the time in our simulation. S2 is going to be X, Y, and Z directions and uh, extents in S2, S3, and S4. We're going to have the volume, the pressure, the potential energy, the kinetic energy, um, the total energy, and the temperature. And so if you look up um, all of the thermal variables 
in the LAMP documentation, you'll see that these are all built-in variables that you can call. And so what we're going to do is we're going to call this six. So this is going to be applied every time step. And by appending file and giving a file name and screen no, we're actually going to dump all this information to an output file. And it's this output file we're actually going to analyze with the MATLAB script. So it's just a different way to dump information to an output file. Dump allows you to typically dump app and position, so the trajectory of your simulation. Fix allows you to dump sort of information about your simulation, so temperatures, pressures, etc. cetera. Um, coming down here, we're doing the thermal block. So we're going to print thermodynamic information to the screen every 500 time steps, and we're going to customize it to print the following information. Um, so this is actually a very useful thermal block because we print the step, the time of our simulation, the CPU time we've been running, and then CPU remain is a special internal variable for LAMPS. It's an on-the-fly estimate of how much longer you have left to run. And so you can figure out whether you have time for a cup of coffee um, or time to actually go for a nap. And so CPU remain is a good one. And then the extent of the system, pressure, potential energy, and temperature. Okay, last part of the green block. We're dumping our trajectory. We've seen this before to a file called dump.eq.lamps um, crash. And so that's actually going to dump the atom coordinates just the same as before. So this file is going to contain our trajectory. This file is going to contain information about our simulation as it was progressing. So very different output file. Um, OK, so any questions about this? Again, the best way to do it is learn by doing. And so in your, uh, as you actually run this code, you can mess with this and see what the effect is. And actually, in your project, it's designed for you to build your own input files and, uh, and run them yourself. OK, finally, we've done all the setup. In this blue block, we're actually doing a microdynamic simulation. And so it's the simplest part of the script. We call the, the uh, keyword run and tell it how many steps to go for. So under the hood, what's happening is LAMPS is appealing to the Verlet algorithm, and it's going to run it for 15,000 time steps. So this is the number of steps you're going to run. And so you multiply the number of steps by the step size, and that's going to give you the time of your simulation. And so you can see why it's, uh, it's rather appealing to get greedy and try and make this bigger and bigger and bigger, because that makes your simulation longer without actually increasing the number of steps. But for the reasons we talked about, that's not a good thing to do. Um, OK, and so then we're clearing the fixes in the dumps. And so we're unfixing the, uh, the, the fix number one. And so that was this uh, barostat and thermostat we had up here. And we're undumping dump number one, which was this trajectory dump. And so why do we want to do that? Basically, we're closing out these files because in one second, we're actually going to have a new block of uh, instructions where we're actually going to yank on the top and the bottom wall uh, and do a new simulation. So this is just the equilibration simulation. Then we're going to do a deformation simulation. So we want to make sure we've closed out our files so we don't overwrite them. Um, OK, and then the final thing here is we're saving the equilibrium length for our strain calculations. So we've relaxed our system. We want to see how long it is in Z. And so we're storing the variable um, LZ into this, this big L, big Z naught. And so that's telling us, after we've equilibrated, how long is my system in the Z dimension? Uh, because then when I start applying a force, I want to see what its strain is going to be. OK, so that's the equilibration block of the, of the code. And so that will do it for today. If you are particularly keen, there's only one more thing to look at. So you can look at the deformation block. If all this makes start sense to you, you can go ahead and run the code. Uh, but we will pick it up right here next time. Um, OK, so that'll do it. Uh, if you have any questions, please come talk to me. Uh, office hours are happening immediately after class. If you have questions about anything, um, otherwise, I'll, I'll see you all on Thursday.